In this video, I wish to explore an interesting religious tension that occurs during Julian's Persian campaign. Firstly, let's set the stage for the religious character of Julian. When Julian was in his infancy, his extended family suffered a brutal purge, which his cousin, the Christian Emperor Constantius II, son of Constantine the Great, played a significant role in. Julian was spared due to his age, and was then whisked off to exile, where he received a Christian education, and was reportedly an excellent student. Yet, Julian was greatly attracted to paganism, and in 351, he secretly converted to the old ways. It wasn't the typical paganism, however, which Julian found himself embedded in. Instead, he was attached to what us moderns refer to as the Neoplatonic school, under the tutelage of Maximus of Ephesus. Neoplatonism flourished in the 3rd century, and this philosophy aimed to provide a complete metaphysical picture of reality and all being within it, based on the syncretism of Plato and Aristotle. Iamblichan Neoplatonism, that Julian engaged with, placed heavy emphasis on theurgy, or divine activity, which included ritual, astrology, numerology, symbology, sacrifice, divination, contemplation, music, and much more. To oversimplify the issue, Iamblichus's teachings were less intellectually rigorous, but more innovative, magical, and mystical compared to those of Plotinus, who founded Neoplatonism. Due to a series of issues, Julian found himself the only suitable candidate for junior emperor to Constantius II, the same man who purged almost his entire family. Subsequently, he was bequeathed the rank of Caesar. He served with distinction in the western half of the empire, with his military successes being particularly notable. Our main source for Julian's reign and Persian campaign is Ammianus Marcellinus, whose work is excellent, and I recommend reading it from start to finish. Ammianus was a pagan officer in the Roman army who accompanied Julian on his Persian campaign and deeply admired his emperor. He is, however, not without criticism of Julian, as we will find out. Julian's use of oracles, omens, prophecy, sacrifice, and all manner of religious undertakings was hugely prevalent throughout his reign. In fact, as tensions between Julian and Constantius II were increasing, Ammianus relates that he received omens of dubious interpretation, and that Julian was concerned at the possibility that some of these interpretations were inventions to flatter him. Then, his worries were calmed by a dream informing him in verses containing an astrological date that Constantius II would die soon. After the outbreak of civil war and Julian's acclamation as Augustus, Julian continues to engage in various religious activities in order to receive insight into the future and confirm the fate of Constantius II. Here we see a foreshadowing of a future error, but in reverse. Despite a skilled soothsayer producing signs from animal entrails that Julian would be victorious, he neglects to advance into enemy territory. Regardless, Julian becomes sole emperor in 361 after Constantius dies of natural causes, as was foretold. Now Julian is master of the Roman Empire, and Damianus tells us of an interesting anecdote that occurs at Julian's court. Julian appears to rush to greet his Neoplatonic mentor Maximus, and Ammianus relates that this is not appropriate for an emperor. Ammianus uses a quote from Cicero to introduce his dislike for Julian's circle of philosophers, implying they are untrustworthy hypocrites, and states with disapproval that Julian would do well to remember this. Furthermore, while Julian prepares for his Persian campaign, Ammianus comments on the excessive nature of Julian's religious practices, and how this resulted in shameful indulgence among the soldiers. He also makes clear that Julian did not appear to be a good judge of skill when it came to those who claimed knowledge of omens and divination, and that he allowed anyone from any school of thought to offer their input. He also notes that Julian engaged in so much curiosity for a variety of pagan practices that it was as if there wasn't a war to be fought. This is all despite the fact that Ammianus himself appears to believe in the predictive power of various pagan practices, and in his work spends some time elaborating on them. He calls it an important branch of learning, suitable for wise men, probably in response to Christian criticism of Julian and such practices. Ammianus certainly believes in most traditional ways of divining the future, and explains their divine origin. As a result, he places human interpreters at fault for any errors in these messages. After setting the religious tone of the expedition, Ammianus explains how Julian's campaign was marred by possible indications of ill fortune from the preparation phase onwards. These ill omens included an incident where Julian is referred to by the crowds as Felix Julianus Augustus, with the former two names being shared with two men who had recently passed away. Then there was the sudden death of the eldest college priest while Julian was climbing the steps of a temple. Less controversial omens soon followed, one being an earthquake in Constantinople, which according to those whose opinion Ammianus seems to respect, forbids the undertaking of an offensive war. Next, the ancient Sibylline books of Rome were consulted, and these also recommended against war on foreign soil that year. However, after making his way towards Persia, Julian then observes an omen that predicts success. 
His horse called Babylonianus falls in distress, and its jeweled adornments scatter all over the ground. The ancient city of Babylon was an important cultural centre in the Sasanian Empire due to its almost legendary status in ancient history. This account seems to contrast Julian's own abilities at divining the future with the experts, despite Ammianus stating earlier that Julian was a skilled interpreter. Later, Julian makes offerings at the shrine of the deified Gordian III. As Julian approaches the border settlement of Dara, another omen occurs. Julian's men bring him a huge lion which was slain by their arrows. Ammianus offers two different sources of interpretation for this omen. The first is from the Etruscan soothsayers, who had long been dissuading him from this campaign. They evidence from their books on war that this sign is a certain warning against continuing the invasion, because it indicates the death of the leader of the invading army. The contrasting opinion is from the philosophers, who Ammianus notes were often in error and keen to discuss subjects they were not knowledgeable about. Here we see evidence of Ammianus' more typical paganism demarcating from Julian's Iamblican philosophic sympathies. Ammianus chastises the false arguments of the philosophers as it results in them interpreting the omen wrong. The philosophers state that Galerius, when he was about to face the Persians, received a slain boar and a lion from his soldiers, then won a resounding victory. However, Ammianus points out that Galerius was fighting a defensive war and it was the invading Persians who had transgressed on Armenia that this omen signalled defeat for. In the current war, Julian was the invader, so this omen spelled doom for him and his army. The following day, a similar disagreement once again occurs between philosophers and unnamed interpreters of omens, possibly it's the aforementioned Etruscans again. A soldier named Jovian, a significant name because it means of Jupiter, was struck by lightning and killed. Ammianus relates that once again Julian was dissuaded from continuing the campaign by these interpreters, who referenced their books on interpreting signs of lightning. The philosophers, on the other hand, we are told, proposed a naturalistic explanation for such displays of lightning, and considered it not worthy of attention. They then state that if the lightning was in fact an omen, it can only be a good one. Sometime later, and after some successes, Julian's men approach the Persian capital of Tesphon. However, Julian offers sacrifices to Mars the Avenger. The sacrifices don't go well, and Julian swears never to sacrifice to Mars again. Ammianus points out that upcoming events would mean that this vow was never broken. Shortly after, the officers and the emperor decide that the Sasanian capital of Tesiphon cannot be taken. Things take a turn for the worse after a move into the interior of Persia. The situation is difficult due to the lack of provisions available for the army, and because Julian erroneously ordered the burning of his fleet. After some further engagements, an armistice of three days occurs. Julian retires to his tent and admits that a figure, the genius of the Roman people, that had appeared to him during his acclamation as Augustus, was now seen veiled and departing from him. Julian leaves his tent to pray, then sees a strange astrological event, probably a shooting star, and once again asks for interpretations. He is concerned that this is a sign from the vengeful Mars whom he had disavowed earlier. The Etruscans are once again called for their interpretation, and they declare that this is a terrible omen, and no military action should be undertaken. They beg Julian to at least postpone his march by a few hours, but to no avail. Ammianus makes no comments on the opinions of the philosophers this time. Had Julian himself realised he had been misled by them, or were they now ashamed to offer their opinions? Ammianus relates that that day Julian is killed in the fighting, stabbed in the side by a cavalryman's spear. Ammianus' narrative of the rivalry between philosophers and Etruscan diviners now closes, with the latter being proven correct. As Julian lays mortally wounded, he is comforted by the fact that the location of his death was foretold to him in prophecy. Ammianus sums up Julian's reign in eulogistic fashion and presents a glowing report. However, Ammianus does concede that Julian had some flaws. Notably, he critiques Julian's religious practice as superstition rather than observation of traditional religion, and we saw that play out when Julian preferred the opinions of mystical Iamblican philosophers instead of the ancient, reliable, and highly esteemed Etruscans. Thank you for watching. Both positive and critical comments are welcome.